Hello. Welcome to Atheist Talk, produced by Minnesota Atheists. At the end of this program, you'll see contact information for Minnesota Atheists. We hope that if you like what you see, you'll consider becoming a member. My name is August Berkshire, and today I'm going to talk about the evidence for evolution. Now, there are many things that support the theory of evolution. Today I'm going to talk about six of them. There's probably even more than this, but these six are um, easy to grasp once you understand them. Uh, they are fossils, similar structures and functions, similar genetics, embryology, vestigial characteristics, and atavisms. So let's start with fossils. The dating of fossils. Yes, they are quite old. They're also found in the sequence that you would expect from evolution. And also the location is what you would expect from evolution. Something doesn't start to evolve in one part of the world and then it's, you know, continues on somewhere else and then it jumps back. Closely related fossils, especially if they're land species, are found uh, close together geographically. Now when it comes to dating, uh, sometimes creationists will say, well, uh, radiometric dating is um, a radioactive element that decays, such as uh, radium, for example. Um, and as it decays, you know, it, it uh, leaves less and less of itself, and there's a daughter uh, element to it. If we only had one element that we were using to date things, uh, then we might not be sure. Maybe the uh, speed of dating varied. And this is what creationists claim. They say that in the past, uh, the element decay decayed a lot sl uh, more slowly. And so we're getting a false idea of deep time. And this might be true if we only relied on one element. But as you can see from this chart, there are about 10 uh, elements that we use. And the key thing is they all have different rates of decay. And so, uh, you know, one is decaying at this rate and another, say, at this rate. And they're all converging on the same number for deep time, uh, showing a, a Earth that's about four billion years old. So because we have different elements at different decay rates, and they're all giving us the same number uh, for the age of the Earth, the age of fossils, then we can be pretty sure that this is a reliable way to date things. Another thing that I mentioned is the sequence of fossils. You find going from similar to more complex. It would be astounding to find uh, a human fossil four billion years old. But no, we find the simpler fossils uh, dating earlier. We also find uh, transition species uh, falling exactly where you would expect them to, uh, to land. So for example, uh, we have the the well-known tree of life. Uh, starting from the bottom on this slide, there was a common vertebrate ancestor. Vertebrate means uh, has a backbone. And it split and went into the lampreys and another line continued and uh, the fish split off and the amphibians and the lizards and uh, the mammals and then chimpanzees and humans. So it's a branching procession. And this is what the fossils show us. And this is what you would expect from evolution. Uh, transition species. We have a lot of transition species. Uh, might be hard to zoom in exactly on the words on this slide, but this shows the fossils we have going from fish to land creatures, uh, land amphibians, and then, of course, uh, finally to humans. So we have these transition species. Uh, this is an artist's renditioning of some, of some of them. On top, you have something uh, 397 million years ago that's clearly a fish, a water-dwelling uh, creature. Then you have Tiktaalik uh, coming later, and it's a transition from ocean creature to uh, land. And then finally, we have the land creature. And, uh, even today, this is an existing species, this Mexican walking fish. You can see that here's something that exists today that would look uh, 
like the kind of thing that could eventually evolve into a species that would be on land. Another example are mud skippers. Uh, again, something half in, half out of water. So the, the transition from water species to later on species that can survive on land, we have examples today uh, that would look similar to transition species. Uh, another thing we have very well documented are the evolution of whales. Uh, going from land mammals, uh, and it, it's interesting that life, as we showed, came from the sea, went to land, and now there were some land mammals that ended up going back into the sea. And so we have transition species for that. Uh, gradually, they, the hind, the front and hind legs became flippers. Eventually, they lost the hind flippers. Uh, and so there are a number of, uh, this is for whales, there are a number of, of uh, species of mammals. Dolphin, for example, uh, is a mammal, and its ancestor was once a land animal. Walrus being another one. Okay. Uh, this, again, shows you some more of the transition species. And, it, and it's interesting that uh, when this evolution started, uh, the early species that were pretty much mostly still on land, they're all found in the area of Pakistan. And this is what you would expect from evolution. Now, once the evolution proceeded far enough and they became more and more ocean-born, they could swim around. Then later evolution, uh, we, find, we find species a lot farther away from Pakistan, but the early one where they're tied to the land either totally or uh, partly. Um, it's all taking place in the area of Pakistan. In fact, one of the species is called Pakicetus in honor of Pakistan. So uh, we have uh, land, uh, life starting in the ocean, coming ashore, and eventually uh, becoming mammals, one chain becoming mammals, and eventually some of these mammals return to the sea. And there's a good book on this it's called At the Water's Edge, Fish with Fingers and Whales with Legs, How Life Came Ashore But Then Went Back to the Sea by Carl Zimmer, who writes a lot on uh, evolution. Now, not only do we have uh, know how species evolved, uh, particular organs or parts, for example, the evolution of the eye. A lot of creationists say, you know, eyes could not have possibly evolved. Well. We know how they evolved. Um, starting in the uh, upper left, just any cell that was uh, susceptible to light, could just recognize light, that would have been an advantage to know when it, when it was light out, when there was sun out. Um, maybe there, there are fewer predators in the dark. And so if you could differentiate between light and dark, and this is not on a conscious level at this point, uh, Nature would have selected those that could distinguish, that you know, uh, didn't move around too much until it became dark, for, uh, for example. Uh, that's one way that selection could have occurred. And then eventually, uh, as if it becomes more concave, you can get some direction to the light. When it's first just a flat surface, light hits it, you can just tell light and dark, but if there's any sort of indentation, then you can start to detect direction. So I won't get into all the details. We could do a whole lecture just on the evolution of the eye. But it is uh, fairly well known to scientists how the eye evolved. Now, not only do we know about the evolution of species, evolution of parts, such as the eye, but also behavior. Uh, this is a book, Primates and Philosophers, How Morality Evolved, by Franz de Waal. And that would also be a whole lecture how we find uh, morality, basically, in other species. Uh, compassion, grief, uh, justice, revenge. We find these in other species besides humans. OK, well, now uh, we'll move on to the second uh, category of evidence for evolution, and that is similar structures and functions, often called homologous structures, homologous functions. And a lot of you are familiar with these pictures. Looking at the bones of the human hand, we find parallels in a cat and a whale and a bat because we have a common ancestor. Now, sometimes a creationist will say, well, 
you know, God just got a really good design and he stuck with it. Well, but think of the whale. Uh, there are a lot of ocean creatures that uh, are not mammals, they're fish, and they don't have uh, this bone structure in their flippers. So God evidently found another way to do it. And the best uh, explanation is that uh, a whale has a common ancestor to a human and a cat and a bat. And uh, going again with bats, birds do not have this kind of structure in their wings. Only a mammal that flies has this, like a bat, has this kind of structure because it has a common ancestor uh, with humans, cats, and whales. Uh, here's a couple other species. Uh, frog, similar structure, horse, uh, porpoise. So we find, this is what evolution would predict. If you have a common ancestor, you're going to see similarities in structure and uh, in the function of those structures. Uh, I found this actually on a, a horse um, breeding website. And it's not just a few bones that we have in common. It's quite a lot of bones and organs, say with horse. Uh, you can see the, the color coding there. Uh, because we have a common ancestor. Well, now we'll move into the third category, and that is similar genetics. Uh, a lot of you know that we're very similar uh, to chimpanzees, a little less similar to gorillas, um, a little bit less similar to orangutans, a little bit less similar to rhesus monkeys, but and we're 99.9% similar to each other. And so this is what you would expect. If you have, if you diverged from another species fairly recently, uh, the genes have not, are not gonna have had a lot of time to change. And so you're gonna be very similar genetically. Uh, here's another sort of a tree showing uh, that the farther back you go, the less similar you are. So as we, as we go to the right, uh, we get more and more similar genetically. And, and this is what you would predict from evolution. <coughs> this is another one um, showing that, for instance, if we start to the right of the human uh, with baker's yeast, we only have 18% uh, common genetics. Uh, wine that's used for grapes, we're 24% similar, because we actually do have a common ancestor with uh, grapes and, and baker's yeast. It just was so long ago, there's been a lot of change in the genetics. And then proceeding around, you can see we're more chicken, 65%, uh, dog, 84%, etc. Even behavior, there's genetic similarities. For example, uh, echo, lo echo locating, where bats, you know, send out a pitch and they hear the echo back. Uh, uh, whales, dolphins do this. Uh, they found a set of 14 amino acids that code for this echo location. And it doesn't matter if uh, you have wings or flippers, what kind of species you are. If you have this echo location, because of a common ancestor, it's these 14 amino acids uh, they're creating it. Okay, the fourth category uh, evidence for evolution is embryology. Now you probably all know that humans early on have a tail, for example. This is uh, showing various species, human, monkey, pig, chicken, salamander, and we all have tails at the beginning because we, we have a common ancestor. And uh, the tail ends up in its final analysis, being shaped a little differently for each creature. Uh, for humans, uh, we totally lose it, usually, by the time we're born. This is a little closer, uh, comparing cat embryo to a human embryo, and you can see we both have, again, tails. And if you look at the embryonic development of a human, uh, you can see much more clearly in this picture a series of of how the tail is quite long at the beginning and how it slowly kind of gets uh, reabsorbed into the body. Okay. Uh, now this is a uh, spotted dolphin. Now, as we said, dolphins evolve from land mammals. Land mammals uh, had uh, front legs and hind legs. 
And in the embryonic form of the dolphin, you can see the buds that could have grow to be front and hind legs or front and hind flippers later on. But as it turns out, dolphins have lost, uh, and whales too, the hind legs and hind flippers. The tail was sufficient for uh, propelling them through the water. They didn't need these hind limbs, and so they evolved away. So, but in the embryonic state, we can see those hind limbs circled in red, uh, and they do eventually go away, but that is a clue to evolution. Because why would an embryo evolve uh, or have a state where it has hind limbs that it's gonna lose? What's the point? That's really a waste. But it's a remnant of evolution. It's a remnant of its past, and that's why it makes sense. Now, here's another one, uh, the flatfish. Now, the flatfish is <clears throat> it's kind of like a normal fish that's on its side. It's pretty odd. But there's an advantage to something like this. It, it blends into the bottom of the ocean, and so there's an advantage to be this kind of fish. We actually have uh, fossils showing uh, how the eye kind of uh, moved <laughs> from being you know, a regular uh, fish with uh, eyes on two sides of its head to it slowly, you know, as species proceeded, got to be a, a creature with eyes on both sides of its head that could lay flat on the ground and still ha not have an eye in the sand. And it's interesting, when you look at the modern flatfish, uh, it shows these stages. The, the embryo, because we're talking about embryology now, the embryo of a flatfish starts out with the eyes on both sides of its head. And as it proceeds in the embryonic stage, the eye does actually migrate all the way over so that then by the time it's born, it's got the eyes on both sides of its head. And this is a clue to its ancestral past. And this is the kind of thing that evolution accounts for. Uh, creationism, this makes no sense uh, in a creationist world. Okay, evidence for evolution, vestigial characteristics. Vestigiality refers to genetically determined structures or attributes that have lost some or all of their ancestral function in a given species, but have been retained during the process of evolution. I'll give you a uh, some examples. The most famous ones, of course, are uh, birds that can't fly, ostriches, emus. So they, they've got stubby little wings, but they can't fly. Well, that's a vestige, a vestigial characteristic. They evolved from birds that could fly. Now, a vestige doesn't have to be completely useless. I mean, the, the wings, when they're running, perhaps the wings you know, can help them keep some balance. Um, the function is greatly diminished from what it was in the ancestral species, which was a bird that could fly. Now, all of these birds are uh, in Australia and New Zealand. So uh, what happened was birds flew to these islands, and on these islands, uh, they must not have had any natural predators that would eat them that they needed to fly away from. And it gets very cold. We, don't, we forget that. It can get very cold at night in Australia and New Zealand, and body mass uh, is a real plus. And so uh, evolutionary pressure selected for more body mass to keep the, the bird warm, and it wasn't so important that they could fly. They developed uh, long, strong legs to run, so they could run away from predators instead of needing to fly away. And uh, so that's the balance that evolution selected. But if you were creating these things from scratch, the way creationists say they were created, you'd be better off giving them some arms, uh, some four limbs, not, not wings that are practically useless. So evolution accounts for this very well. Another thing we find in some snakes, again, snakes uh, are amphibians. Their ancestors came from the water. They uh, had four limbs and in snakes, you can sometimes see the vestige of their ancestry, little snake buds in the back of the snakes that in their ancestors would have grown into legs. And now, the, uh, their most of the bones are inside the snake usually. Usually they don't see any little protrusions. 
the bones are inside the snake, so the snake can slither around fine and the, and the little buds aren't um, inhibiting it. Uh, but the bones are still there. And why would you create a snake from scratch that had leg bones if it's never going to walk, if those bones are going to stay inside the body? It makes no sense from a creationist point of view. It makes a lot of sense from an evolutionary point of view. Okay. Whales, too. Again, we talked about how whales used to be land mammals, or their ancestors were land mammals. And again, we find the bones. The hip bones and the leg bones are inside the whale. Uh, they're not even attached to the spine anymore, but they're there, the whale, and they're inside the body so the whale can swim smoothly through the ocean. Uh, again, but why would you create a whale from scratch with bones it's never going to use and that aren't even attached to the body? But this is a vestigial characteristics. It's a vestige. It's left over during the process of evolution. And in an ancestor, it actually did have a use. These legs, these bones were bigger. They grew into actually hind legs in an ancestor that was walking on land. Of course, we're all familiar with the appendix. Uh, we have found some use for the appendix. It's a very small organ. Now, again, a vestige doesn't mean it has no use. It just means it has diminished use. And our ancestors used to eat a lot more grasses than we do, grasses and grains that were harder to digest. And so it was actually much more useful back then. Now you know, we can have it removed. I've, I've had an appendectomy. I'm fine. So uh, it, has diminished, it, has, it still has a little bit of use, we think, but it's greatly diminished from what it once was. One of my favorite vestigial characteristics are goose pimples. Now, we get goose pimples when we're cold uh, or when we're afraid, little goose bumps. Now, this is really of no use to us. But in our ancestors, when you got cold, see, what happens is the pimple raises the fur up, raises the hair up, raises the hair fur. So, for instance, in a polar bear here, uh, when the fur is raised, when you're cold and the fur gets raised, it traps air in that fur and the air warms up and it keeps the polar bear warmer. So a goose pimple is good if you've got a lot of fur, it'll help keep you warm. Or when you're scared, a lot of us know you back a cat into a corner, it goes rawr and it raises its hair. And that makes it look larger and more ferocious. And that's an advantage, it might, you know, it, it, a cat back in the corner can be pretty scary, and part of it is the hair raised. So if you have a lot of hair, a lot of fur, uh, goose pimples are good when you're cold or afraid. They're really of no use to humans because we don't have enough fur. But they're not really harmful, so they've stuck around. And it's a vestige of our, of our ancestry. It's another clue that evolution really did happen. Also our tail bones. We no longer have tails. We saw in the embryonic state that there are tails. Uh, they recede inside the body. But we still have the tailbone where our tail used to be. And, uh, sorry. and sometimes that even uh, the tailbone grows a little uh, to a few more vertebrae, as if it's trying to become a full tail. Finally, we have atav atavisms. Uh, the reappearance in an individual of characteristics of some remote ancestor that have been absent in intervening generations. So, for example, uh, as I say, dolphins no longer have hind flippers, but every once in a while, uh, we find one that does have the hind flippers, that that gene gets activated and creates the hind flippers. Uh, here, as I was telling you a second earlier, the human tailbone, normally it doesn't grow this long. It's, it stops a lot shorter, but here we have uh, an x-ray of a girl that had the extra vertebrae uh, because humans, or our ancestors, used to have tails, and the gene is still there. And in this case, it got expressed a little more than usual. Extra nipples, that's another sign of, uh, of an atavism. We came from mammals that used to have a lot of offspring and thus had uh, the female needed a lot of nipples to suckle the young. And so every once in a while, uh, you'll see a human born with extra nipples because our ancestors 
had multiple nipples. Uh, again, uh, another evidence that evolution is true. So, uh, in conclusion, we know uh, that evolution is true because uh, we have fossils, similar structures and functions, similar genetics, embryology, vestigial characteristics, and atavisms. So, evolution is very gradual change we can believe in. I uh, want to just mention a couple resources. This, of course, uh, you know, maybe if you're watching this as a podcast, you can stop and zoom in on those. If you contact us, and we'll have the contact information in a second, uh, we'll be happy to send you this list uh, that I've used for uh, resources, showing that evolution is true, showing why creationism is false, why intelligent design is a failure. A uh, couple of really good books I'll just mention from this list, Why Evolution is True by Jerry Coyne, Evolution, the Triumph of an Idea by Carl Zimmer, Richard Dawkins, The Greatest Show on Earth, and Evolution, What the Fossils Say and Why It Matters by Donald Prothero. These are all very good written for the average person uh, like most of us are, non-specialists. Non this is a really good site, Index to Creationist Claims, and this is free online. It's also in book form, but it's, it's free too. So look this up, tinyurl.com slash creationist claims. If you want to see just hundreds of creationist claims debunked, this is a good site. Uh, this is an, another wonderful one that combats this idea of intelligent design. It's called Some More of God's Greatest Mistakes. And it just goes one by one, just really poor design, things that aren't functioning well, things that could be, you know, could have been designed a lot better. Okay. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, let's see. I'd like to uh, thank you for joining us for Atheist Talk, produced by Minnesota Atheists. You can see contact information here on the screen, and there'll be a roll at the end of the show. And we'd be happy to send you a sample newsletter. Uh, if you just contact us, and we hope that if you like what you see uh, from our shows, uh, come to our meetings, get our newsletter, go to our website, that you'll consider becoming uh, a member of Minnesota Atheists. If you're interested in us, we're interested in you.